It was 6.30 a.m. on February the 13th, the day before Valentine's Day. My then four-year-old son and I were at Heathrow Airport, about to travel to Israel. His great-grandmother was celebrating a milestone birthday, and we were in duty-free, looking for some jewellery. My son eventually picked a gorgeous diamond pendant necklace. The salesperson turned to him and said, What a beautiful choice. Your mother is going to absolutely love this. My son paused, looked at her as if she had two heads, and eventually said, I don't have a mother. And with that, he ran off to look at something at a nearby display. In near tears, the salesperson turned to me and said, I'm so sorry. When did your wife pass away? Time out. <laughs> I'd been up since 4 a.m. and thought I'd done brilliant only in one cup of coffee, small child in tow, in getting us to the airport through check-in and security. Now I faced a dilemma. Did I come out gay? Did I explain that I adopted with my now ex-husband? Did I share that I am, in fact, a single parent? When you guys saw me here today, did any of you think that I could be a divorced, single, gay dad? I suspect not. I was as invisible to you today as I was to that salesperson at the airport. Authenticity isn't possible. Not for me, and not for you. Our invisibility stands in the way. What I mean is that all you ever see is a facade, a combination of what I am willing to share, overpowered by your own preconceived notions, stereotypes, and biases. But since the 80s, diversity initiatives have suggested that authenticity is achievable. I'd summarize their approach with an equation. Diversity plus inclusion equals authenticity. Does it, though? I am diverse. Most people I meet say they are inclusive, but I am rarely authentic. And in fact, more often than not, I am invisible. The equation doesn't add up. So back to my story. Heathrow Airport, duty-free, 6.30 a.m. With me in dire need of a cup of coffee and my son about to run through the airport, I had two choices. I could A, continue to lead the facade created by the salesperson's own preconceived notions and assumptions. Or B, I could start oversharing a lot of personal details about my private life with a complete stranger, all in an effort to show the real, authentic me. Well, I copped out. I smiled politely, asked her to wrap the necklace, and off I went after my son. But why? I said the authenticity equation is broken. It's more than that. The organizational response to diversity actually kills authenticity rather than fosters it. Does it matter? Well, it does if we're going to respond to a rapidly changing demographic. According to a Deloitte study, millennials, those born between 1980 and 1995, will make up 75% of the workforce in the next eight years. Unlike my generation, millennials don't think of diversity as a reference to characteristics such as race or gender, sexuality or religion. Instead, millennials focus, amongst other things, on the acceptance of individualism. Individualism, in my view, is interchangeable with authenticity. So while the current model sees authenticity as the end result of inclusive diversity practices, we need to instead support a new majority that sees authenticity as the starting point. So how do current diversity and inclusion programs actually smother authenticity? Any model that singles people out for being black, LGBT, female, you choose the category, goes against the very grain and nature of inclusion. Instead, it fosters an environment of ghettoization, pigeonholing, and stereotyping. I don't fit into a single box. No one does. And that multiplicity is something that diversity and inclusion programs fail to acknowledge. If we are going to accept authenticity, then we need to accept the individual. And individuals are diverse for a host of reasons. I recently met Mary. She's a 42-year-old single black lesbian mother to two teenagers. She is Muslim 
and she has a career in finance. Mary ticks a lot of diversity boxes. <laughs> She could join any of a host of her employer's diversity support groups, the Black Network, the Women's Network, the LGBT Network, but each one only represents a small part of who she is. If authenticity is about bringing your whole self to the table, what do all these segregated networks aim to achieve? Mary can't be herself in any of them, and even if she had the time to join them all, how are all these networks meant to work in tandem? The answer is, they can't. They don't. Instead, they work in isolation and they highlight difference. And the minute we start putting people into boxes, we start allowing preconceived notions and assumptions and biases to cloud how we view an individual. Remember my supposed dead wife? When I was young, I remember going into Toys R Us and seeing these long shelves of Barbie dolls. Do you remember those dolls that were always dressed for a special occasion or environment or a different situation? I sometimes laugh that I'm like a Barbie doll. <laughs> My Tuvia dolls would take up an entire shelf. There'd be corporate Tuvia and charity Tuvia, Papa Tuvia, family Tuvia, fitness Tuvia, party Tuvia. But together, they would create authentic Tuvia. Now, if you considered one of those Tuvia dolls in isolation, you would naturally judge me and consciously or subconsciously create a mental picture about who I am. But each one of us, each one of you, is a diverse, multifaceted creature. That is the beauty of individualism. The danger comes in assumption and bias. When I started the school run, the rumor mill was ripe. It started with all this talk about what my wife's high-powered job could be, such that the dad was doing the school run. Next, when my ex-husband appeared, clearly we were a very progressive family for having hired a Manny. <laughs> Next, when the actual nanny appeared, a 20-something blonde Eastern European woman, well, I was having a midlife crisis and I just turned my wife in for a younger model. <laughs> Now, I didn't take the opportunity to overshare details of my life with any of the parents, but nor did any of those parents ever stop to ask me a question. The net result was that their heteronormative assumptions of the world became my reality. My entire life was assumed, and no one had ever asked me a single question. Perhaps asking a question is just too uncomfortable. The Schoolgate scenario example applies equally in the workplace. The establishment of diversity networks fosters an all-too-common assumption that everyone within a silo is exactly the same. It means that those on the outside don't ever need to get to know anyone because they think they already know who they are simply given their membership in a particular diversity group. And that membership isn't by choice, but it happens automatically in the outsider's mind. Should Mary join the LGBT network or the black network or the women's network simply because that is where she should fit in? Each one of those networks simply highlights Mary for being different. Each creates a Barbie doll effect. Authenticity will never happen if we are not prepared to get to know the real Mary, or the real me, or the real you, for that matter. And getting to know someone to that degree is going to take time. And time is not a commodity that many of us have. More importantly, it's going to require each one of us to start sharing a lot of personal details about ourselves. Now, that might not be something I feel comfortable doing. More so, it might not be something you feel comfortable hearing, because it may very well challenge your own innate assumptions and biases. Ultimately, being authentic is going to be awkward for you and me. I will put my hands up and admit that even I have sometimes stereotyped and pigeonholed and allowed my preconceived notions to take over. A few months ago, in the lead-up to LGBT Pride, my son and I were discussing the importance of Pride. I focused on the fact that we were an LGBT family. The conversation did not go as expected at all. My son said, there are only two gay people in my family. The majority are straight. Why do we have to call it LGBT?
he had a point. The second and more challenging was his assertion that I, I was not accepting of diversity. He said, if I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, I am proud of you for being gay, where's your t-shirt that says you are proud of me for being mixed race? Why are we talking about celebrating diversity and only talking about LGBT? I made two mistakes in continuing that conversation. First, I said that weekend was about celebrating LGBT pride and that we would celebrate his mixed race heritage during Black History Month. <laughs> Second, I myself failed to acknowledge my son's multifaceted diversity. And I then allowed my own preconceived notion to apply, thinking that having two gay dads would be more defining to his authentic identity than being mixed race. So there you have it. That's the problem. But there is a solution. And its elementary simplicity may make some people think that it's just not achievable. First things first, break down silos. Don't foster an environment of ghettoization that facilitates the making of common assumptions. Second, become a champion of diversity as a whole. Don't just be an LGBT champion, for example. Because as an LGBT champion, I would assume, indulge me for a moment, that you would still champion for the rights of women and other visible minorities. And finally, once we bring authenticity alive and bring it out, don't smother it and put it back in the closet. Consider what happens in businesses during end-of-year appraisal and promotion cycles. Are managers working with a predefined notion of candidacy that is just too rigid to accommodate individualism? If so, authenticity by default becomes a bad thing, and we reward people better for being a stereotype. After 30 years of the same, there is hope. Millennials are pioneering a new way of thinking, and each one of you can help expedite change by grasping on to that mindset. We started with an equation that was broken. I'd like to leave you with a different one instead. Authenticity equals surrender. Me surrendering to the awkwardness of oversharing. You surrendering your preconceived notions and assumptions to get to know the real me. Let's have real conversations with real, authentic people. I know, it sounds basic, but basic is okay. And having those conversations will mean asking some uncomfortable questions. As I said before, being authentic is going to be awkward for you and for me. And most importantly, it'll require each one of us, each one of you, to admit and acknowledge that today you are each invisible to each other, and perhaps even to yourselves. I say enough is enough. Stand up and start the journey of unveiling yourselves. <laughs>